Yeah, welcome to IMC. So this evening, I'd like to tell you a story from the ancient Buddhist tradition, from the ancient, <clears throat> the ancient discourses of the Buddha. And the story is, I take it as being a fable. You'll have to decide for yourself whether it's a fable, myth, or report of true events. And uh, this story, um, in, in kind of my imagination of how it came to be, is that uh, there were people in the ancient times, ancient Buddhists, who sometimes liked to have fun. And they liked to have fun in offering some profound teachings. And um, so it was kind of offered in, a, in order to make some interesting points. Sometimes if you have myths or fables, they make some interesting points that stand out kind of in a highlight. And, and uh, if you're part of the ancient world, maybe you would laugh and smile and about it, about it all. And um, so I don't know if you will laugh and smile or cry or get upset. Um, the, um, <clears throat> and in it, it has a, 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 one of the things that makes it kind of special is someone asks the Buddha for his teachings in, in brief. Uh, and so the Buddha offers him a very brief synopsis or a kind of summary or pointed kind of formulation of what is most important. Now, in this ancient world uh, that Buddha lived in, there were people who believed that um, great spiritual teachers had omniscience, that they could know everything. And so it's a little bit uh, the Buddha goes along with that. Uh, tell me in the instructions and saying how you could become omniscient. So that should be interesting if you're interested in such things. So listen carefully. So um, I suppose once upon a time, that doesn't say that to here, it says, thus have I heard. <laughs> the um, one of the great gods of the pantheon of gods of the time. His name is Saka in Pali. And it's said that uh, it's the Pali word for the god Indra. So Saka um, um, went to see the Buddha. And he paid homage first. And then he asked the Buddha, Venerable Sir, how in brief is a monastic liberated in the destruction of craving? So here the liberation that the Buddha was talking about, the particular form of liberation, freedom that he was talking about was freedom from craving. Another way of saying it that's a little bit more, makes more sense maybe for a modern audience, is freedom from attachment of all kinds. So how is a monastic liberated in the destruction of craving, being one who has reached the ultimate end and attained the ultimate security from bondage? I kind of like that. So how do you get completely free from being entangled, being caught, being trapped by anything whatsoever? And. Um, and have uh, and, the, and attain the ultimate holy life, the ultimate goal, and one who is foremost among gods and humans. This is an interesting idea. Becoming form the, the great god, right, of the pantheon is saying, how do you become foremost among the go humans and gods? How does a monastic do that? How does a renunciant do that? So, and so the idea here is in this Buddhist text that. Uh, the, what's the attainment of liberation, the full spiritual awakening, uh, puts, puts people at a plane or at a level in the hierarchy um, higher than even the highest gods. So the Buddha then uh, replies, Here, ruler of gods, monastics have heard that nothing is worth clinging to. 
And he goes on a little bit more, to elaborate a little bit. But nothing is worth clinging to. And that's kind of like, that's the pithy statement. And so that's the summary, that's the heart kind of thing that the Buddha had to tell, a great God. Nothing is worth clinging to. And it's one of those phrases that is very worthwhile carrying around with you for a while and reflecting on it, thinking about it, debating with it, arguing with it, uh, protesting best you can. Come up with ideas of when it's okay, when it's worthwhile to cling. When should you cling? One of the ways to kind of consider this reflection is that if you're doing something wholeheartedly, whatever you have to do, you do it wholeheartedly. So you can't really do more effort. You're doing it wholeheartedly in a good way. Is it better if you are clinging at the same time as you did it? Do you need to cling if you're engaged wholeheartedly in what you're doing? Or is clinging a bit of a wind drag? Is clinging a little bit of a, you know, makes it a little bit harder to do what you're doing? If you're with a person that you love a lot and you're able to share your time together, are you better off just being with them? Or you're a little bit, a little bit better off if you clung? <laughs> Or, or is it really not worth the, the advantages that come from clinging? Not really worth clinging to this because it's already good. So those are like two little examples you can you consider. That one suggestion is that uh, maybe people sometimes cling to things when they're not doing their life wholeheartedly. And that's a kind of funny thing, right? If you're not doing it wholeheartedly, maybe the more likely to cling, or maybe clinging comes from yourself wholeheartedly to what you're doing. So that's more of the reflection you can do. You can think about how this work might work for you. Nothing whatsoever is worth clinging to. So then the Buddha goes on and sa- continues. And this is the omniscient part. So you're probably waiting at the edge of your seat for this part. When, a, when monastics have heard that nothing is worth clinging to, they directly know everything. They know something about everything. That's the omniscience the Buddha was interested in. Not omniscience where you know everything about everything, past, present, and future, but rather to know something key about everything like a common denominator or common aspect of all things so that you can have a wise relationship to no matter whatever you encounter in your life. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you know something that is liberating, that's freeing, that's worthwhile about that thing. And the thing that can make you omniscience, if you, if you really understand this, that nothing whatsoever is worth clinging to, no matter what you encounter. Not that, not that. Is that right? What do you think? Having directly known everything, they fully understand everything. Having fully understood everything, whatever feeling one feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful or pleasant, they abide contemplating impermanence in those feelings. So here we get into a part of the Buddha's teachings that is not going to be obvious to everyone, I think. But he has a way of saying that everything that we encounter and we experience, we experience through the filter, or say like a a funnel, like like maybe like an hourglass, like the whole world that we experience goes through the hourglass of our contact with the world how we experience, touch the world, and see the world, and smell the world, all kind of through our senses. And when everything goes through the senses and then comes out the other side, into the brain, for example, that's where we reconstruct everything. That's where we make up. We know now that the brain is a big reconstructing machine. And it reconstructs the images and ideas of what's going on. 
<clears throat> but it goes through the, the filter, the kind of the, the, the funnel of our senses. And as, as our experience of the world goes through the funnel of our, of our senses, there is a feeling tone, there's a hedonic tone to that experience that's either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And for the Buddha, in his kind of strong capacity for mindfulness and concentration, if you can be really present in the moment, in the place where you actually make contact with the world, and you see that that contact and that feeling is impermanent, that it arises and passes, it comes and goes, it, it appears and disappears. There's something about seeing the inconstancy of it which is at the heart of the Buddha's movement towards freedom. So he says, if you can see it that way, that all this is being impermanent, then that begins a process towards freedom. And that process begins by becoming disenchanted with those feelings. Disenchanted means no longer enchanted, no longer in the, in the spell of them. It breaks the spell. That whatever kind of attachment is kind of a spell. Um, and then uh, uh, these, these feelings begin to fade away. Not the feelings, but our attachments begin to fade and it isn't that attachments just, you snap your fingers and you can stop being clinging. But with insight, with understanding, then attachments begin to fade away until they finally cease. Contemplating thus, they do not cling to anything in the world. When they do not cling, they are not agitated. When they are not agitated, they attain nirvana. So that's the good news. That's the little story. So the, the god came down to see the Buddha and he wanted to be told in brief. And you'll see, partly he wanted things in brief because gods have a lot to do. <laughs> and so, you know, you don't want to, you know, you have places to go, IPOs to open, important things to do. And so you want to kind of get your spirituality quickly, efficiently, so you can, you, can, you can go on to other, maybe more important things. So, um, so then the Buddha accommodated him and gave him this very powerful teaching, kind of a nice summary or something. Other places, this is unpacked and explained you know, in greater detail to make, it, make sense of it. It's kind of in brief. So then, Sakka, this great god, the great ruler, uh, decides it goes home back up into the heaven where he lives but nearby listening to this conversation is a disciple a monastic disciple of the Buddha by the name of Mahamuglyana and Mahamuglyana is curious uh, how well did Saka hear and understand what the Buddha uh, taught so he decides to go visit him so in the way that they were able to do back then <laughs> so Mahamugliana says, uh, did that God penetrate to the meaning of the Buddha's words or not? Suppose I find out whether he did or not. Then just as quickly as a strong person might extend their flexed arm or flex their extended arm, the Venerable Mahamugliana vanished from this earth and appeared among the gods in the heavens. It's a pretty good trick. <laughs> uh, so now, on that occasion, Sakka, the ruler of the gods, was furnished and endowed with a hundred, uh, uh, endowed a hundredfold with five kinds of heavenly music. And he was enjoying it in his pleasure park. <laughs> so it's pretty good to be born these high gods because it's, it's, um, you have a lot of good karma and so you get a lot of pleasure and delight and all kinds of wonderful things. So he got to all this music and, um, and in a, a different version of the story, he's not only listening to music, but he's also taking a bath with a hundred celestial maidens. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
but that's in a different Buddhist tradition. And that, that <laughs> but in, in our tradition, <laughs> we're a little bit more modest <laughs> about our fantasies. And so Saka sees Venerable Mahamogliana coming. And so he uh, stops the music and goes over to Mahamogliana and says, come good sir, Mugliana. Welcome good Mugliana. It is long, good sir, since you found an opportunity to come here. Sit down, good sir. This seat is ready. The venerable Mugliana sat down on the seat made ready. And the great god Saka took a low seat, a more humble seat, and sat down to one side. So this, is, of course, is great PR for Buddhists, for Buddhist monastics. You know, like these Buddhist monastics, even the highest gods will take a lower seat to the Buddhist monastics. So it's a little bit of PR, I think. And, um, and then Mahamogyana asks him, Saka, how did the Buddha state to you in brief the liberation by destruction of craving? It would be good if you might also, if we might also get to hear that statement. Can you re repeat what the Buddha said to you? So, then, Mugliana's answers like this. Remember, this is a guy hanging out in his pleasure park listening to music. Good sir, Mugliana, we are so busy. We have so much to do not, not only with our own business, but also with the business of the gods of the other heavens. Besides, good Sir Muliana, what is well heard, well learned, well attended to, well remembered, suddenly vanishes from us. <laughs> good Sir Muliana, it once happened that war broke out between the gods and the titans, these other godlike creatures. In that war, the gods won and the titans were defeated. When I had won that war and returned from it as a conqueror, I had the, a great palace built. Good sir, Mugliana, the palace has a hundred towers and each tower has 700 upper chambers and each upper chamber has seven nymphs and each nymph has seven maids. Would you like to see the loveliness of the great palace? <laughs> the question was, can you repeat to me the, <laughs> the profound statement the Buddha said? And the answer he gets, the monk gets, come look at this palace. <laughs> so, um, so the Maha Mugliana consented in silence. Then the Sakka, the ruler of the gods, went to the palace, giving precedence to the venerable Mahamugliana. When the maids of Sakka saw the venerable Mahamugliana coming in the distance, they were embarrassed and ashamed. They went each into their own rooms, just as a daughter-in-law is embarrassed and ashamed on seeing her father-in-law. So too, when the maids of Sakka saw the venerable Mahamugliana coming. They were embarrassed and ashamed, and they went each to their own rooms. So no wonder he's busy. Then Saka, ruler of the gods, had Venerable Mahagliana walk all over and explore the palace. See, good sir Mahagliana, the loveliness of the great palace. And Mahagliana said, it, it, uh, it does the Venerable Sakya credit as one who has formerly made merit. And whenever he, so because he did a lot of merit in a former life, he got born to be the Sakya, the great God. You don't get born as a God unless you did something really fantastic, good deeds. And so he must have done some really good deeds, good, good karma. So Mogiana is saying, hey, you must have done something really good to merit this. 
And uh, the traditional commentary on this story is he's kind of telling him, don't forget that you have to keep making merit. <laughs> you can't just kind of sit around and enjoy the pleasure because you're going to lose it all the next time you die. Because in, in Buddhism, uh, gods don't live forever. And so you should continue to make merit. Um, but this seems to go by Mughliana. Um, then the Venerable Mahabhulyana considered this. This God is living uh, much too negligently. What if I stirred up a sense of urgency in him? So, you know, this guy needs, to, he, this guy needs a lesson. Isn't he? Guys, again, this is important, this life of ours. And the sense of urgency is a fantastic word in Pali called samvega. And it's a sense of spiritual urgency. It's like, this life is short. The task of kind of coming to the bottom of our craving, becoming free, um, uh, is a really important matter. And so this is, some people get this idea, oh, this is important. I've got to do this. I can't, shouldn't waste any time. So the sense of, this is what the sense of urgency means here. Um, so uh, what if I stirred up a sense of urgency in him? Then the Venerable Mahamugliana performed such a feat of supernormal power that with his toe, he made the great palace shake and quake and tremble. Saka, the great god, was filled with wonder and amazement and said, Sir, it is wonderful, it is marvelous. What power and might the recluse has that with his toe he makes the, this heavenly abode shake and quake and tremble. When the Venerable Mahamogliana knew that Saka, ruler of the gods, was stirred to a sense of urgency with his hair standing on end. Imagine the great god. I guess he got a little afraid. A little earthquake. So um, then Mahamogliana said to him, how did the Buddha state to you in brief the deliverance, the freedom, and the destruction of craving? It would be good if uh, we might get to hear that statement from you. And then, so now he's gotten Mahamogliana's attention. So then he repeats the statement. Nothing whatsoever is worth adhering, uh, clinging to. That's, that's the, you know, the end of the most exciting part of the story. And uh, you can imagine that uh, in the ancient world where they had no TV and they had no books, there was no written, uh, written things at that time, that uh, the primary entertainment, the pi primary means for education, for learning, for passing on information was oral. And we believe that in the ancient time there was really rich storytelling. Uh, people had the, uh, probably storytelling was richer in the ancient pre-literate world, world than it is in the current world. So I don't think it did justice, but I think that uh, the story probably was told with great flair. And, you know, and this is, imagine that people's imagination was filled with the image of heavens and palaces and, and also the humor of this great God, you know, kind of being so silly and, you know, saying he's too busy to, you know, repeat this short, brief statement the Buddha said. And then he is busy showing off his palaces. And then uh, Mahamugliana goes back to the earth, goes back to the Buddha, and tells the Buddha, you know, this is what uh, Saka heard, and uh, was, it, was it accurate? And then the Buddha repeats the whole thing over again a third time. So in a storytelling te technique is to repeat the most important thing maybe three times, just so it sinks in. So nothing whatsoever is worth clinging to, is the, is the teaching. And what would happen to you if you carried that f phrase with you through the days and repeated yourself in different situations? Or you, have written, you wrote it out and you put it on your desk or on your mirror and dashboard of your car. Or, you know, you put it across the screen of your smartphone. <laughs> so every time you kind of looked at your phone or you know, got in your car or something, you saw that. Nothing whatsoever is worth clinging to. What kind of reflections would come for, come up for you? What would you think about? What perspective would it give? 
Would it give you a pause to consider what you're doing? Would it function as a kind of a mirror to help you notice if you are in fact clinging or not? At that moment, are you clinging to anything? If not, then go and be happy. But maybe, are, are you attached to something? Are you caught in something? Are you preoccupied in something? And if you are, then ask yourself the question, is it really worthwhile clinging to this? Some people get confused around this kind of question because they assume that if they give up clinging, they have to pursue, they have to give up pursuing something or doing something, engaging something. But perhaps there is pursuit, there is engaging and seeking and doing things, but it can be done without clinging. What does clinging add to the situation? Are you better off because you cling? Are you more effective because you cling? Do you keep things in a more secure way because you cling? One of the definitions of the freedom that Buddha gives is freedom from bondage, security, for, su- su- be safe from all bondage. Clinging is a kind of bondage. Some people, that bondage, that, uh, that grip of their clinging, their attachment, their desire is so strong that it ruins lives. People make huge mistakes in their lives sometimes. So to spend, it, to spend some time, maybe this next week, with this phrase, nothing whatsoever is worth clinging to. And if you want to try to tell me, you know, I'm too busy for that. <laughs> you have a lot of important things to do. Can't do that. Then, then you can remember the story. Even the great God of the heavenly world try to get away with that one. <laughs> too busy. So, that's the story. So, any comments, protests? Do you want to try to convince me that there's actually one thing that's important to cling to? <laughs> what would you like us to talk about? Or questions, anything? Pass the mic. It's just a short question. Can you cling to your ideals? Yes. I think it's possible to cling to anything you can think about. And ideals, some people uh, cling very tightly to ideals and it uh, messes them up. And sometimes it's a problem for everyone else. Some of the great political movements that have been a disaster, someone was clinging to ideals. Did you have to say more? Because that's a, a very interesting question. What uh, prompted, prompts it for you? I was just wondering what I might cling to. What would I put at the top of the list? Oh, your favorite cling. Oh, so, yeah. So, you know, my daughter was high up there. Uh-huh. Not going to do that. And uh, my ideals are things I believe are important, the mm-hmm. things I really care about. Mm. Um, that Great. seemed like something I might try to grab mm. onto. So th- then it, part of this investigation is, is there a distinction between uh, commitment or, or, a, or some wholehearted engagement in ideals versus clinging? And what's the difference? And which, you know, which, is there a way of being involved in ideals that's supportive and helpful? Is there a way of being involved in ideals which is harmful? I think that uh, teasing that apart is part of this investigation. Thank you. If you can pass the mic over here. Seems like, uh, in a sense, uh, bonding is a sort of uh, can be a sort of uh, unconsciously developed clinging. Uh, could you talk a little bit about B- bondage? the bondage? Bo- uh, uh, bonding to somebody. Oh, bonding. Yes. Yeah. So yes. a loved one. Yeah. Well, it's kind of in- the English, at least here, has uh, 
uh, uses the word bondage. So the word bond kind of t- means to tie something together. Yeah, I mean, this is where we have to be very careful with semantics and the meanings of this. You know, in, in Buddhist English, you know, we have our own jargon, you know, in Buddhist English. And uh, the word attachment is considered like a pretty bad thing in Buddhism, in Buddhist English. But when my, uh, when, uh, my first son was born, my wife went to a uh, local organization here in the Bay Area called uh, Bay Area Attachment Parenting. <laughs> uh, and there's a psychological term called, a, you know, there's healthy attachment, there's attachment, you know, dysfunctional attachment t- disorders and things. So, um, you know, exactly what we mean by these words, we have to be a little bit careful. If we very, too quickly, um, uh, bond, and the word bond looks a little bit too much like attachment and we dismiss it, we might miss some of the healthy uh, connectivity, the can, healthy bonding, healthy uh, relatedness that, uh, that can happen between people that's actually important. Like for children and parents, it's very important. And, um, and to have that develop strongly. I remember the, uh, one of the times when my son was quite young that I kind of saw this operate and was I, I, um, he was a toddler, so he was just beginning to walk. But he didn't have much sense of the world. And I was walking down the sidewalk in, in uh, town and I ran into someone I knew. So I said hello and we started talking. And I was just, you know, I was kind of taken by surprise and engaged in this person I was talking to. And then suddenly I realized that enough time had gone by, I had no idea where my toddler was on the sidewalk with busy streets and cars. And, uh, and so I immediately uh, spun around. I mean, my instinct was like I spun around and uh, to, make, uh, out, to look out towards the direction of the street to make sure that he wasn't out in the street. I said, wow, that was quite an instinct. And so that's, you know, that's kind of maybe a, you know, I had a kind of a primal bondage with him. And so that, you know, was probably my job to have that kind of connection. But I don't know if that's clinging. I was thinking of uh, unwillingness to um, let go or to lose, uh, given I mean, bu- the uh, Buddhist emphasis on uh, the non-permanence, impermanence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so unwilling to let go, unwilling unlo- to lose something. Yeah, that's pa- that can be painful. I mean, if things are going, it's painful to hold on to them when they're already going. People hold on. That's a fairly common clinging, is to not let things go when it's time for them to go. And, you know, there's uh, the um, the Zen teacher in San Francisco, uh, Shinryo Suzuki Roshi, he defined um, renunciation um, as... um, um, Something like um, uh, accepting, uh, allowing things to go when they go. In uh, picking up on the issue of attachment from a psychological perspective, um, I remember reading the novel Siddhartha in college, and I don't know how accurate that is. In terms of the it's very accurate. Of his for, life. It's a very accurate depiction of Herman Hesse's imagination. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it 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 disturbed me greatly that uh, the Buddha in that story left his family, and that the idea that that was a important part of his liberation. Yeah. Yeah, in the ancient uh, uh, story, and you know, from the ancient times, uh, it said the Buddha also left his family. Um, and it's the way it's the myth is told, we don't know exactly if this had happened, but it's kind of there's all these myths around the Buddha. But the myth, the way it's told, is that um, uh, he left the day his son was born. So that's you know in you know that's a, in the mo- in our modern sensibility that's a horrible thing to do. We don't know what it meant in, if that's happened. We don't know what that meant in the ancient world. He he, he was supposedly in that myth kind of royalty. Uh, uh, in, there are cultures where a uh, father has very little to do with the child until the child is a certain age. There are some cultures when they're six or seven, that's when the, the, the father starts getting involved in the child's uh, life. But until then, it's, uh, it's the mother and the women who are involved. So, 
So exactly, we don't know all the, all the ins and outs of the culture of the time. He certainly didn't ab abandon them to poverty because they were, it was, you know, they were a uh, royal family. And, um, and the, you know, there's many ways of looking at this and understanding this, you know, this issue. Um, but we, don't we have examples even in the modern world of young people who decide to leave their families for a great cause? In America, we have, we certainly, I mean, by we, but this, uh, some people in America um, uh, give high praise to the people who decide to join the military. And then they go off and some of them do leave their family and their kids in order to serve their country. And it's considered a great honor and a great thing to do that. Uh, some people will decide to do things like that for the sake of an education. Uh, you know, I need to, I really need, I really, this is important, I need to go off and uh, I need to get, you know, I, so I'll go to a different country, I'll go to America to get an education, I'll come back. But I know that we have a young child, but this is our future, is to go get this. And in ancient India, there were no schools, there was nothing like this. But uh, I can imagine that some people, I'm not, I've met people who are so deeply uh, stir, stirred up, a sense of urgency, to try to understand what this is, life is about, and that yeah. life as it's given to them just doesn't make any sense to them. And they are going to, uh, you know, wither up and die if they can't really try to understand and find out and discover what this is all, life is all about and do this in their spiritual education. And he might have been one of those people who almost didn't have any choice, you know. Maybe he was deeply depressed. Who, you know, who knows what was going on? But, uh, you know, I don't think it's too hard to imagine someone whose personal circumstance is such that's, that that kind of choice is the only thing that they can do. If we measure, the, the tendency is when people, we look at that story, is we see it through the eyes of kind of being a standard family, a standard situation. And, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a two or three standard people around it. <laughs> so who knows what was going on? Uh, but what we do, what the stories do continue, that um, uh, when the, when uh, his son was seven, the Buddha returned to his son's life, and then uh, and then he was the primary parent for his, the rest of his son's life. So we don't think of we don't think of the Buddha as a parent, but he you know that's. Uh, he was apparently the primary parent for the rest of his sons growing up. And the Buddha and his son became a monk and, and was happily ever after. There's a, <laughs> there's a, there's an, I wrote an article about how the Buddha taught his son. Um, that's on the article page of IMC's website. So maybe you have time for one more. You know, there's a lot of men have spoken. Are there any women who would like to say? <laughs> so maybe just. At what point is the Dharma itself no longer worth clinging to? Oh, when is a Dharma itself not worth clinging to? Well, that raises the interesting question, when is it worth clinging to? And um, so, you know, this whole question of uh, what, what is worth clinging to, uh, uh, you know, it's a great question. And uh, sometimes the answer is that um, uh, for the time being, some things are worth clinging to. And, um, you know, if someone has a trouble with addiction, for example, it's better to cling to something that will keep you from drinking you know, rather than not cling to that and then succumb, for example. And sometimes the strong tendencies of the mind and the attachments, the neurosis, the fears, the, and the you know, all kinds of them, you know, some people's minds have tremendous challenges and uh, their hearts have challenges. And so the way, sometimes we need some stability. We need something to hold on to for a while to get our bearings. And so sometimes clinging is worthwhile. Uh, but it's understood to be temporary. The people who cling too long, for you know, way beyond it's lo no longer needed, uh, don't become free. So that's that's one possible answer. Uh, you would have something to say about that topic? Is survival clinging? Yeah. 
the um, I've known people who uh, have trained people how to survive in the wilderness, and they say the most important thing you can do is don't panic. And panic is a sign of, of clinging. Generally, people's minds uh, are more intelligent when they don't cling. So in terms of problem solving. So, but uh, you think it can be very brief? Love. Clinging to love. Why is that good? How is that useful for you? So clinging to glo- love is kind of like clinging to universal goodness that fills the universe. Is it possible to relate to that love? to be involved in it, to be connected to it, maybe even be committed to it without clinging. Uh, that's, a good, that's a good point. But at least in Buddhist English, clinging is, um, is kind of like, we, we say sometimes, you know, the person was clinging to me and it just feels very uncomfortable as someone kind of clawing at, at us. Clinging is, is a compulsive attachment, a compulsive drivenness around something where we can't easily drop it. it. We can't just say, stop doing it. It just keeps coming back. It keeps hounding us. It keeps pushing and insisting. It's kind of like a little bit of an obsession. So please, be devoted to love. But my, my image of, you know, clinging to love begins to squeeze the life out of it. So great. So uh, if you're interested, spend the week with that phrase. Nothing whatsoever is worth clinging to. And see what you learn. Thank you.